So we are still in Jude. We're starting in Jude, verse 14. Uh, if you remember, Jude is only one chapter long. Uh, last week, that was a doozer, wasn't it? Was that a tough one last week? It was. It was. Um, do you remember who Jude was really talking about last week? Was it just sinners, or was it a specific type of person or people? I thought it was like leaders of the church. You got it. Were, yeah. You got it. Uh, leaders, teachers of the church who were teaching false doctrines. And he does not have very good things to say about them. And we need to be very careful on who we listen to when it comes to biblical teaching. Um, as I said, like I'm also teaching through Jeremiah in my other study, right? And Jeremiah lays the boots to these guys. And you don't hear that kind of talk in church. Because Jesus is all happy, happy, joy, joy, love, love, love. Well, Jesus also has some standards. And as we go into Jude, Jude's kind of going Old Testament here. And we're, we're picking up where we left off. We finished in verse 13. And uh, if you remember verse 13, it ends with, they are wandering stars. Uh, the Greek word is planetos, uh, meaning planet. That's where we get our word planet from. It means it's like in an orbit. It never stays still. It's not anchored to anything. There's not anchored to the word of God. They just do what they want. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. That is not a good place to be. And if we follow those, that teaching, we will end up there too. So let's go to verse... Hold on here. I'm smelling my, my soup. And I think it's been on a little too long. Let me turn it off the off the uh, off the stove here. Okay, so we will be continuing, and we'll go into verse fourteen. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, "Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. So who was Enoch prophesying about? His people? Yeah, the, those false teachers. The ones that were teaching false doctrines. We're going to learn more about this tonight. And Enoch, this is very interesting. You'll, the only place in the Old Testament you really read about Enoch, uh, godly Enoch, okay, because there's an ungodly Enoch in the line of Cain, but Enoch in the line of Seth, or Shem, I guess. Uh, no, Seth, in the line of Seth. Um, he's the only one to be raptured. You, you'll read about him in chapter 5. And he lived 365 days. And then he was no more. For God took him. He started walking with God when he was 65 years old. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. Who is the Lord coming with? Angels. Okay, so what's unique about Enoch? 
I just told you. He was raptured? He was raptured. So, what do you think these tens of thousands are coming back? People that are raptured? The saints? They're coming back with his holy ones. Verse 15. To execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. What is the main word in that verse? It's repeated three ungodly. times. Ungodly. Okay, so the Lord and his holy ones are going to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly. The ungodly just doesn't mean those outside of the church. There's people who... I, I, I can't say they're in the church, but they they associate with the church community. They go to church. Okay? You, you, you know the difference, right? There's a difference between a church person and a Christian. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. If you've been in church any length of time, you're going to know there's a big difference between a church person and a Christian. Okay. To execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of how many of their deeds? How many of their deeds of ungodliness is he, are, are we going to convict them of? All. All. That they have committed in such an ungodly way. How did they do their ungodly deeds? In an ungodly way. That's right. Look. Jude's just not talking about sinners outside the door of the church. This is about people who are trying to bring in false doctrines and heresies and get people to go away from God. There is going to be hell to pay. Verse 16. These are grumblers. You've never heard a grumbler in church, have you? Malcontents. Following their own sinful desires. What are they following? The sinful desires. The ways hey, you, you notice what they're not following. God. God's word. It's their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters. Okay. I'm scared to say this because I'm I'm scared I'm going to come off as boasting. And I hope that's not the case. But when we pray for Dakota tonight, was I disappointed he wasn't here in this Bible study? Or was I excited that he was in a men's Bible study in his local church? You were excited. I was very excited. Okay. If I was a false teacher, I would be very upset that he would be there at his local church instead of with me. Because I need the attention. Do you see the difference here? Yes. Okay. My ministry for you is, number one, let's get you saved. Number two, let's get you discipled. 
Number three, let's plug you into a local church and have you be a blessing to that local church. I hope this never comes across as the Jason show. Okay? I hope it, it doesn't. Following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Showing favoritism to gain advantage. What are they showing? Favoritism. favoritism. Why are they showing favoritism? To gain advantage. Okay. Do you want me to put this in today's terms? You want today's terms in church are? Church politics. If you start politicking in church on, you know, I don't think this guy should be an elder. Maybe this guy should. Uh, I don't know. Pastor kind of stepped on my toes. Let's kind of get a group together. We'll try to get him out. That's what it's talking about. You start playing church politics, what's getting reserved for you? You got hell to pay. You got hell to pay. If you see people, if you see people in your church politicking, take them to Jude. Say, you're about to get the wrath of God. You are showing you are not a believer in Christ. And you're showing that you would rather do church politics to get your own way instead of following Jesus and glorifying him. How many people have been burnt in church because of church politics? I know a few pastors that church yep. crucified. Oh, yeah. I know that Milo got burnt. You know, and he wasn't the one getting the burn. He just saw it happen. You know, that is something else. You start church politicking, this is a warning right from the Bible. You better repent or you're going straight to hell. Start glorifying Jesus, living for his glory, and not your politics. Verse 17. Now, we're done with the bad stuff. That was a lot of bad stuff, wasn't it? <clears throat> Verse 17. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus. What does Jude tell us to remember? Well, before that, oh, just, just a second. Let me, let me back up, and then you can answer it there, Joey. What did Jude call us? Beloved. Beloved. What did he tell us to remember? Predictions. Of? The uh, apostles of our what they were saying. Yeah, of our of the Lord Jesus. Go back to Jude one. Okay. Does Jude call himself an apostle? No. no. Who was Jude's brother? Jesus. Does he call himself the brother of Jesus? No, nope. just a servant of Jesus. A servant. Let's go back to this. Verse 17. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of 
not me, not the brother of Jesus, the other guys, the apostles. Jude saying, look, I'm listening to the apostles. Jesus was my brother. And I'm listening to the predictions of the apostles because Jesus spoke through them to us. Do you he see? Sounds like he was very humble. Extremely humble. Extremely humble. Verse 18. They said to you, was it one apostle that said this? I would say more than one. More than one. Say. Yeah. They said to you, in the last time, there Talk will you be... after study's over. Pardon me? Pardon me, Joe? Sorry. Sorry, okay. I just got a message come across, so I messaged Vern back. He forgot it was study, and he's trying to call me. But okay. It, it jumped into here. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. They said to you, in the last time, or in the last days, there will be scoffers. Are there people scoffing at us and scoffing at Christ? Absolutely. Okay, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Are there people in the world and in the church following their own ungodly passions? Yes. Okay. Verse 19. It is these people who cause divisions. Do you think that Jude is concerned about divisions outside the church? No, inside the church. Inside the church. Why do you think he's concerned, more concerned about divisions inside the church than outside the church? Division will destroy a church. That's right. And if you have divisions in the world, the world gets destroyed. The, the, the world is united around one thing. Hate Jesus. That's it. And when we start allowing that in the church, I'll tell you, it's going to fold. It is these who cause divisions. Worldly people. What kind of people? People of the world. Inside the church. If you do not know how to recognize that, you're in trouble. It is these who cause divisions. Worldly people. Devoid of the spirit. What do they not have? Any spirit. The Holy Spirit. We don't have it. Okay, let's look at this. Let's break it down. We've got people politicking in church. <coughs> They're causing divisions in church. They're following their own ungodly passions. When, I, when he says ungodly, I want you to think about this. There might be a pastor or a deacon or an elder saying, we need to do this building program. And people are like, well, what if we don't do the building program and we plant other churches? <clears throat> and now there's divisions because one has a building program, the other one's have, saying, let's plant churches. Which one is worldly? You guys know? Building. The building. Because they're making it all about their name and not about the name of Jesus. Come to First Baptist Centerville or whatever. Let's build a huge sanctuary and a fellowship hall and we'll put in a bowling alley for the kids. Instead of, let's get the gospel out to the people.
I'm not saying that building projects are ungodly, but I'm saying if there's an option to go plant churches, put your money into planting churches or put your money into a building project, go with planting churches. Verse 20. We're going to see something here between 20, 21, and 24 that is going to sound contradictory, and we're going to have to work through it. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit, but you, belive, but you beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, what are we supposed to be building ourselves up in? The most holy faith. Building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Who are we supposed to be praying in? Jesus. What does it say? The Holy Spirit. Okay. I thought the Holy Spirit was in us. How are we to be in the Holy Spirit? The Trinity. There's three in one. Holy Spirit being one of them. Right. If you guys listened to my Jeremiah study on chapter two last week, I'm finishing chapter 2 tomorrow. You're going to see that jump from Jeremiah to John a lot. In John 15, Jesus says, Abide, uh, he says, I am the vine, the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Any branch that does not bear fruit, my Father cuts and removes. Any branch that does bear fruit, my father prunes, so it will bear more fruit. Abide in me, and my words abide in you, and you will bear much fruit. How do we bear fruit for Christ? By getting pruned. He prunes. By sharing the gospel. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. So oh. second, second Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God. The word for breath can be breath, wind, or spirit. Every word of God is spirited out, if you will. Have his spirit-filled words abide in you. Read it. Yeah. Chew on it. Put it in. Memorize it. Meditate on it. And then do it. Okay? Verse 21. This one is interesting. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus that leads to eternal life. What are we to keep ourselves in? God's love. Okay, you see a problem with this? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You have been saved by grace, through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not of works. So no man can boast. 
If God's the one that saves us because of his love for us, Ephesians 2, 4, but God in his great love for us, right, made us alive together in him, how, I thought God did it all. How do I keep myself in the love of God. God will never let me go. How do I keep my... Why would you say this? These are some struggling questions we need to ask, huh? I don't know. Keeping your Bible instead of the world? That would do it. As a matter of fact, he lines it out here. And I want to tell you some <clears throat> facts from some studies that I'm putting in tomorrow night's study. Guess how many people in the church in the West share the gospel at least one time per year? Most five percent, yeah, five percent of the church actually less than five percent, it's four point something. Don't eat, they share the gospel at least once. That means that over 95 percent of the church does not share the gospel. What? That wow. is correct. Any wonder why Canada and the United States look like how it does? Number two. Seventy-five percent of churchgoers do not know what the mission of the church is. Seventy-five percent. Sounds like we got a lot of false teaching in the church right now. Would you say? Yep. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus that leads to eternal life. What are we waiting for? Mercy. The mercy, but I thought I already got mercy at the cross. Does that mean I'm not really saved? No. Okay, let's talk about it. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, guys, I'm asking you these tough questions because... Satan is going to get in your brain and say, you see, you're not really saved because Jesus didn't do anything for you yet because you're still waiting for the mercy of God. And Satan's going to get in your brain and say that. And you won't know that you have true salvation. The word salvation in the Greek. is in the perfect tense. You have been saved. You are being saved. And you will be saved. Okay? There are three theological, active theological parts to salvation. Justification. That's the moment you were justified, the moment you believed. The law was satisfied. Jesus pronounced you just because he executed the justice on himself, on your behalf. Justified. From the moment of justification to your death or rapture, whichever comes first, 
is the process called sanctification. You'll, you'll read about that in the Bible. And sanctification is the process of looking more and more and more like Jesus. And the third part, which Jude is talking about here, is glorification. And that is when we get our new bodies and we look just like Jesus Christ. And we will be in glory and glorify him forever. And that mercy is shown when he returns. Okay? Now, I have some friends, different friends. Same story. They're married. And the wife, before they were married, the girlfriend at the time, hated rap music. You guys like rap music? I'm not a fan. But if you like it, uh, no judgment. Okay? Rap music. You guys like it? Yes, no? No. Not really. Not really. Okay. That's fine. Not my cup of tea. Okay. Not enough twang in it. <laughs> anyway. The woman ends up marrying a Christian rapper. Guess what kind of music she ends up really liking? Rap music. Christian rap. Why? Because she loves her husband. She starts loving what he loves. Do you get that? I do. Who's the bride of Christ? The church. So technically, if we're loving what if we if we're his bride we should start loving what he loves when was a savior first promised in the first testament yeah in genesis chapter 3 right, right after adam and eve sinned savior's coming Genesis 3.15. Okay. Now, we've just learned something here tonight. Less than 5% of the church shares the gospel at least once a year. 75% of the church doesn't even know what the mission of the church is. Why do I go like that? Verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Verse 22, and have mercy on those who doubt. Who are we, who are we to have mercy on? Atheists and people no, no, who don't no, believe. no. That's not what it says. People who doubt. People who that doubt. God is real. Okay, so what would cause them to doubt? Teachers. Well, oh, okay, okay, okay. Hold on here. Gina, the Earth is a trapezoid. You believe me? What, what is that? A it's a different shape. It's a trapezoid. It's, it's actually, well, put it this way. The Earth is not round. It's actually an octagon. No, it's flat. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll say, we won't go flat because there's too much controversy over that. But let's, the Earth is an octagon. Do you believe me? No. So you doubt me? Sure. Okay. I want you to. I want you to think about this. The only reason you doubt me, okay, number one, 
the, well, the first reason you doubt me is because I said it. Do you get what I'm saying here? Like, this is so elemental, we don't see it. If I never said yeah. the earth is an octagon, you, would, you wouldn't doubt it. Is, is this making sense to you? The sure. only way people can doubt Jesus is the Christ is if they hear that Jesus is the Christ. Gotcha. Is this making sense? Yeah. Okay. So have mercy on those who doubt. Okay. That means you share the gospel. They doubt, have mercy on them. Verse 23. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To show mercy with fear. How are we to save others? Snatch them out of the fire? Snatch, like you gotta grab them and you gotta be rough with them. Let's look at this again. Keep yourself in the love of God. Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus that leads to eternal life. Look, you wouldn't know anything about the mercy of God that leads to eternal life unless someone shared the gospel with you. And what Jude is saying in verses 22 and 23, he's saying, in order to keep yourself in the love of God, share the gospel. But Jason, that's works-based. No, it's not. It's love-based. Well, you're earning God's love. No, I'm reflecting God's love. Jesus said, I have come to seek and save the lost. And if I'm calling Jesus my husband, if I'm saying I am the bride of Christ and I want nothing to do with what he loves, do I even love him? No. No. Save others by snatching them out of the fire to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the blood. Verse 24. This is where it gets contradictory. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Stop here. Verse 21 says, keep yourself in the love of God. And the other says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, what is it? Does that sound contradictory? A little. Okay. Let's work this out. It's not con contradictory, it's complementary. How do you know he's keeping you from stumbling? Because you are actively keeping yourself in the love of God. How are you actively keeping yourself in the love of God? The word of God, the spirit-filled word is in you as you proclaim it through the gospel. I'm sick and tired of people saying, but Jason, I don't have the gift of evangelism. 
there's a difference between evangelizing and having the gift. Okay? Something is wrong, horribly wrong with the church. When less than 5% of people are doing what Jesus loves a minimum of once a year. There is something horribly wrong. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Do, do you see Jesus holding your hand here? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Does Jesus have joy in his true bride? Yes. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. We are in a battle of kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And Jude is letting us know, and we've seen by the stats, the kingdom of darkness has infiltrated we have allowed it to infiltrate the church. How are you going to live your life? Are you going to live your life for the love of God and the proclamation of the gospel? Or are you going to let people shut you down? in the church. You're talking too much gospel. You're making me uncomfortable. No, we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace. And they try to shut you down. And here we are saying, be careful. If you love Jesus, you're going to love what Jesus loves. And he has come to seek and save the lost. Be careful of preachers and teachers that tell you otherwise. Amen. Next week, we start Matthew. I hope you're here for that. It's not going to be as intense as Judah.